Hey guys, it's Holly here. And before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you about our free webinar that we're hosting this Thursday on how to craft an effective job description. So reserve your spot at WeStaffTheChurch.com. That's WeStaffTheChurch.com. Church leaders need intentional development to help them discover their capacity. When studying leadership, it can be easy to stare at a with large numbers. I think the most important thing is the church needs to represent the community. Welcome to the Vanderbloom and Leadership Podcast, where we talk about how to build, run, and keep great teams. I'm your host, Holly Tate. On today's episode, William talks with Dr. Ronnie Floyd, who is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention and the senior pastor of Cross Church in Arkansas. On today's episode, William and Dr. Floyd talk about going multi-site, what it's like to lead a denomination, and his new book, Forward, Seven Distinguishing Marks for Future Leaders. Be sure to tweet your takeaways with us using the hashtag Vandercast. That's hashtag Vandercast. Let's jump in. Ronnie, thanks so much for joining us today. Dr. Ronnie Floyd has been a friend and a person I've looked up to for a long time, been a real stellar example to uh, not just the Baptist church, but the larger church. And uh, Ronnie, as you've been, you've been running around a little bit lately doing some convention work. Tell us about what your world looks like right now. Every week during the week, I'm usually uh, gone somewhere. In fact, I've already, uh, we're taping this, as you know, uh, on Wednesday. And uh, in relationship to that, we're, I've already been to Boston and to Vermont and have spoken uh, probably five times uh, since Sunday morning uh, and got on a plane Sunday afternoon. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively always rolling. And I didn't know there were Baptists in Vermont. <laughs> there are not very many, but they are there. That, that's, and, how uh, I, that's how I know our web traffic is winning. I look at the Vermont number. If it's anywhere in double digits, we're great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, I spoke uh, on the campus of Harvard uh, uh, University on uh, Monday night and uh, spoke to 200 college students. Most of them were Asians, and uh, it was quite interesting. I spoke in a lecture room in the Harvard Law School. Wow. One of the joys I have in working with all the churches we work with all across the globe is that it's just a wide spectrum. I mean, our guest last week, I don't know that the two of you could order on order anything the same on the menu, theologically or food or anything. I mean, they were just a whole different thing. Sure. And then to get to turn around and talk to the president of the Southern Baptist Convention the next week, that's just awesome. So <laughs> tell, us, tell us what is going on that's exciting in the convention that would encourage pastors out there that are listening today. Well, you know— um, William, we have 51,094 churches and congregations. And out of all of that, and through what our congregations give to fund the national and and statewide and international ministries of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, there are some fabulous things happening. One, we have over 18,000 students on the campuses of our seminaries. We have six seminaries. And... uh, each one of those seminaries are in the top 10 seminaries in America in total population. Uh, number two, we have some fabulous things happening in church planting. Just last year, we planted uh, just under 1,000 churches at Southern Baptist. And wow. 50 and 58% of those were non-Anglo churches. And so we're really making some strong headway there. And we're also really working hard toward uh, the continual growth of our convention becoming uh, very committed to multi-ethnic and uh, multilingual. We, uh, 20% of those 51,094 churches and congregations are uh, non-Anglo churches and congregations. And so we are way on down the track. Uh, while uh, I cannot prove data that, that someone would say, but I have heard some say that uh, we could very well be the most multi-ethnic and multilingual denomination in the country. Um, wow. That, that really, while that sounds good, uh, we know that it must continue to improve because, William, if we're going to reach this country for Jesus Christ, we've got to span all the ethnicities uh, uh, that are going on. And, and I've been in some fabulous settings recently. In fact, I've, um, just about a month ago, I was in in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, in a church with 2,500 to 3,000 people there, 
at the First Baptist Church of Jackson, I was on the stage with the president of the National Baptist Convention, which has 20,000 plus churches that are, and that is the largest uh, African American uh, Baptist denomination. And we were on stage to the glory of God together. And it was just phenomenal. It was one of the most phenomenal racial unity experiences I have ever been in in my life. And one of the great nights of my life is president of the Southern Baptist Convention. You know, I was in Jackson at that church. We were actually helping them find their next senior pastor. And uh, all they were talking about was that night. I mean, they're yeah. just going on and on and on. And, and when you talk to candidates, make sure we'll give you the video to send it to them because it was <laughs> God was in the house. <laughs> God was in the house. And uh, I'm going back, in fact, to, to uh, Mississippi and uh, along with this uh, dear brother, Dr. Jerry Young, who's the president. And we're going to be working with a group called Mission Mississippi. And one of the things we're going to do, William, which really, uh, if, if you have folks that are listening uh, via Mississippi or in Mississippi, uh, they ought to come and be a part of it because we're going to have a national conversation uh, on racial unity hmm. uh, for about two and a half to three hours. And he's bringing 10 of his pastors with him from the National Baptist Convention. I'm bringing 10 of our representative pastors, which they'll be multi-ethnic pastors with me as well uh, as our Anglo pastors. And we're going to get in a room together and the 22 of us, uh, Dr. Young and I will lead a conversation about what America must do to, to move to being together, uh, as one nation under God, regardless of the color of our skin. That's awesome. You know, when we do searches, we probably 15, 20% of the searches we do, people are like, we need a multi-ethnic presence. And a lot of times it's a church that's in the suburbs of a city. Yeah. And when they planted their church or when they started their church, uh, the neighborhood all looked the same. But now it's diverse, and they need somebody diverse that reflects the community. It's it's fascinating to see how much that's happening and how needed it is to find a multi-ethnic staff. Have you have you found that in your own work at Cross Church? Oh, yeah, we found it, and we're doing it. I mean, we're very conscientious in doing it. Uh, we're very committed to... First of all, having the best staff we can get. Um, but at the same time, we're very committed to going as multi-ethnic uh, on our team as possible. In fact, right now we have four different men that are, that are Hispanics on our team. Hmm. And, uh, and in fact, my, my global worship pastor uh, is a Mexican-American. Hmm. Uh, he lived in Mexico, was raised in Mexico until about 13, 14 years ago. And... and, and uh, if we've got listeners out there that are in that boat and they're looking for somebody that will reflect their community, can you tell us some of the things you've learned? I mean, that was a, probably something new for you from when you started. What are some of the sure. learnings as a as a team builder where you're trying to, to do a brand new thing? Is there, is there anything you've learned along the way to be helpful? Well, I, I tell you, it's a, it's a challenge learning all that. And I think the most important thing is the church needs to represent the community. And uh, Northwest Arkansas which is the home of Walmart, J.B. Hunt, Tyson Foods, and University of Arkansas, and about twelve to 1,400 companies that, that have presence here uh, that service the Walmart account. Uh, we have become highly diverse in this region, which is new to us. Um, now, highly diverse is only about 25% of our population. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's, it's definitely changing and, and continuing toward that change. And what we've tried to do is our commitment is to is to our church will look like our community. And mm-hmm. so we really began to really look at all that and how we can do that. And and you know, William, what 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 I learned and I learned this from from a, a, a friend that that I went and preached for out at Shepherd of the Hills Church in, in California. And Dudley Rutherford, it was an incredible experience. I walked in there on a Tuesday night in L.A., if you can imagine this. The place was jam-packed, and they had three or four other venues outside. There were about five to 7,000 people there. I had never been in a more multi-ethnic experience ever in my life. The Holy Spirit was all over it. His worship team was multi-ethnic. After the service, I asked Dudley this question. I said, Dudley, how in the world did you get that to happen here? He said, Ronnie, we made a decision 
that if we were going to be a multi-ethnic church, then we must have multi-ethnic people on the platform. Hmm. What the platform looks like will usually determine what comes to church. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that was a tremendous insight to me, and I'm really grateful for it. I mean, we're reaching more Hispanic families than we've ever reached before. We're reaching uh, Indian families. We're reaching all kinds. And, you know, you go back to the – I was just in Boston. We have 120 or 30 churches in the metro Boston area uh, of New England, and, 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 that, and out of those, the vast majority of those are multi-ethnic. Hmm. And, hmm. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, you know, I was in an Arabic church uh, where we held the gathering. Wow. And so, you know, it's a different day, and we must get very intentional on reaching all ethnicities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. That's awesome. Hey, let's shift gears a little bit. You're a uh, senior pastor of Cross Church, but it hadn't always been Cross Church. In fact, you've only been senior pastor of Cross Church for five years, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. That's well, right. Walk us through what it was before Cross Church. Tell us a little bit about the decision that you made to, to make a name change and how has that benefited? And, and maybe what have you learned as you've got some other pastors listening that might have the same situation upon them? Sure, William. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, I moved here 29 years ago next month. I became the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Springdale, Arkansas. I was raised in Texas. When the Lord called me here, I had no idea why. I felt like I'd probably be here three or four or five years and, and go back to Texas or somewhere. I mean, there was no association here other than the calling of God. And um, for some reason, the Lord has chosen to, to use me here, and the church exploded through the years. Uh, back in 2001, we became a multi-campus church. We were, research says that we were about one of the first 200 churches in America that became a, a, a multi-campus church. And uh, so in that, you know, we didn't know what we were doing then. We don't know a whole lot more what we were doing now. But we all of a sudden became First Baptist Church of Springdale, and the area was called Pinnacle Hills. So I called it the Church at Pinnacle Hills. And so we were the first Baptist Church of Springdale and the Church of Pinnacle Hills. Time goes forward. And we knew that if we ever went to three campuses, we had a real issue. Hmm. Uh, because we couldn't just keep, it was already an issue with two, and we didn't, we didn't need to keep on adding names. I mean, yeah, that, how, it, how, and then that ended up being longer than Vanderblumen. And that'd be bad. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it like that. Very good point. Uh, but in that, uh, uh, you know, we, we decided that we needed to get ready. Well, when we started one of our Fayetteville campuses. Uh, that was four years ago. Um, and when we did that, we knew at the same time we needed to change our name. Five years prior to that, by miracle of God, and, and it's a miracle of God, we were able to secure the website crosschurch.com. We're talking about the logo for all Christianity. I mean, it's just incredible what the Lord let us do. And and it just became non-debatable that we became Cross Church. So we have now five campuses, and and we just began to really move it forward. And you know what? We weren't mad about being Baptist. I mean, we're, we've used this whole experience to re-identify ourselves. We have our Baptist Faith and Message uh, 2000 uh, statement of faith is all on our website. We have links to all of our SBC matters, and so we're we're very glaring that we're Southern Baptists. Um, uh, but and I'm president of the Southern Baptist Convention, so you know, I mean, that's pretty glaring. And so with that, um, it's just been a great experience. We never had any hiccup in the church over it. I mean, the people already got it; they understood it. And and I and I, and I didn't go at the wrong time about all that. I let things just kind of happen, hmm. you know, which is not always my leadership style. But I just kind of let it evolve. And at the right time, I said, folks, we're coming to do this. And God has just exploded the church since that move. Now, somebody, you know, somebody asked, well, why didn't you name it Cross Baptist Church? I said, you know, I said, listen, I already know enough Cross Baptist. I don't want to, I don't want to put Cross Baptist on my sign. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're just going to call it Cross Church. Trust me. Uh, you know, and so that's, that's the story. That's kind of like people, I went to Wake Forest for undergraduate and uh, they say, 
who in the world named the mascot? It's the demon deacon, right? And I said, I'm pretty sure a pastor named the mascot. I'm not sure. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> oh, wow. So as you as you talk about the convention being a part of your website and your web presence, you got a lot of guys who are trying to hide that. We actually have a couple clients that uh, Oak Ridge Baptist up in Maryland, they polled their community, and the community wanted to hear that they were Baptist. So <laughs> I, I, I feel like somewhere in the very, very awesome move of God in the church growth movement in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, we started to get people that, that were trying to not be part of a denomination. I feel like that's swinging back a little bit now. People want to be part of a family. Do you feel that way? And, and I if do. So, I, I and, do. And, and if so, do you think, could you outline some benefits of being a part of a family, whether it's the Baptist Convention or, or any place else? I think with all that's happening in the culture, William, this is no time for anyone to fly solo. Hmm. I think that we need community more than ever before. We need a strong statement of faith more than ever before. And I think that we have to do more than ever before together. Uh, the ability of being able to reach the world would never be accomplished by one church. It's not even going to be accomplished by a few churches. It's going to take a mass number of churches to do everything we can to penetrate the lostness in America and across the world. And so I, I think for theological reasons, for cultural reasons, for missiological reasons, I think that it's very, very important for people to be a part of, uh, of some network, of some convention, of some denomination, call it what you want to call it. I just think it's imperative. And, and I really believe that because all that is falling in on us around the culture, that the churches that are not identified, they're going to really need somebody more than ever before. That might have been cool five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But you know what? We need strength doctrinally, missiologically, cooperatively. We need it missiologically. We, we need it in every way. And mm. so ecclesiologically. And so with all that, we need to do everything we can to try to be together for the cause of Christ. That's awesome. You know, I grew up Presbyterian, and that, the only reason is because uh, my mother grew up uh, Southern Baptist. Granddad taught Sunday school for 30 years. I've still got his notes, that, I, and I, <laughs> I used to use them when I would prep sermons. And Dad grew up Catholic, so when they got married, they just decided to make everybody mad and be Presbyterian. Uh, so uh, that, out I came. But, uh, I, I, you know, when I talk with my non-denominational friends, you know, back in the 2000s, early 2000s, they say, William, how do you deal with being a part of it? Y'all are dealing with all these issues and mm -hmm. fighting on where you stand on this or that. And that just doesn't make any sense. But now, fast forward, and since the Supreme Court ruling on marriage has come out, every community church I know is scrambling to figure out what's our, what's our statement of faith? How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to communicate? That's the correct. ones that are in denominations already have that. You just, go, right. to, just go to the statement of faith. It's, That's well, correct. So. Yeah, and you know, because of where Southern Baptists have been back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, <clears throat> we already had all those issues solved. That doesn't mean that we don't have to con continually fight for the faith and for the cause of, the, of Christ, but we already had those theological and biblical commitments resolved within our own convention of churches. And as a result of that, now, yes, yes, we know these things are getting tested more than ever before, but guess what? We've already we've already know where we are on that. And and so that's the good news. That doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that we're not in those fights because we fought it when it was more of an internal thing over what the Bible was and what the Bible says. Hmm. That's great. That's great. Hey, I want to uh, shift into another topic. You've got a new book coming out, uh, Forward, Seven Distinguishing Marks for Future Leaders. I love that title. And I always, I always love asking seasoned leaders, you know, what do you wish you would have known if you were 25 again now that you've yeah. had some time under your belt? So tell us about the book and tell us a little bit about what you tell younger listeners out there that, now that you've been around the barn sure. a little bit. Well, first of all, uh, the book came out in uh, June, William. And, uh, and so the book is really a book that tries to say, what does leadership look like in the future? It's not just for young leaders. It's for all leaders. Um, and the whole thing is looking at what is a looking forward, what is a forward leader? What does that mean? Uh, you know, we talk about incredible matters like about truth and about how we need to have forward truth. Well, what is forward truth? 
truth that was truth is truth and will always be truth. That's what forward truth is. And if you've got to go forward with a basis on truth, we talk about the whole issue of cultural sensitivity. We talk about cross-generationalism, which I think is really important. I think so many leaders today that are paraded as leaders, and, and I'm not saying they're not leading, but they're leading limited because they're leading only their generation. And that's just not the will of God. I mean, if you've got something to say, you need to be able to reach up above you in generation. You need to be able to speak to your own generation and be able to speak to the generation below you. And those are the most effective leaders. And we have, we have leaders everywhere, William, getting in the weeds. We stay in the weeds, man. We're so much, we love the weeds. We need to get out of the weeds. And let's, let's see, if we want to lead and be what God wants us to be, we need to learn to lead big, and we need to learn to lead high, and we need to learn to lead deep, and we, need to, we just need to learn to lead in a way that brings masses of people along with us. But we're not just limiting our leadership. So I really think it's an a, a extraordinary opportunity to learn more about vision and leadership and what, it, what it's going to look like in, in days to come. You know, but Bill Hybels uh, was the first place I heard it. But when you see the listing of the spiritual gifts in the scriptures, there's only one where God says, work on this gift if you have it. And yeah, it's leadership. That's right. That's right. It, it, no, no leader has got an excuse for not trying to expand their leadership and lead bigger. And I love that higher and wider and deeper. So yeah. um, uh, Holly will be sending out a link to where you can get that book and, and where you can learn more about Cross Church. Uh, as we as we close out our time, Ronnie, I love to kind of put pastors on the spot a little bit. Uh, first of all, I love to say, tell us a book you're reading that's really got you kind of fired up right now. And, and we we have two rules: you cannot say the Bible, and you cannot say good to great. <laughs> well, that's okay. I won't do the, one of those two. Uh, I would say that um, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts because I run uh, four or five days a week, and. Uh, um, and so in that, you know, I listen. this is why I listened to the Vanderblumen, um, you know, podcast and became, uh, familiar with it. Uh, and so what, what, one of the books that I, I listened to on podcasts and then it really got me involved in, in getting it and going through it is the book on the real life MBA by Jack Welch hmm. and, uh, and his wife. And it's really a powerful book. Um, and, and, you know, I loved his book on winning. Uh, it's obviously a secular book. It's written from that. Uh, I think I may have heard a podcast with him that uh, I forgot what organization interviewed him, but uh, I know it's Dave Ramsey's organization, um, yes. and uh, and that's where I heard it. And uh, so it's it's really a a great opportunity to to learn more about okay the internality, slow down, learn about alignment again, learn about those things that are so important. And it doesn't matter how long we're leaders, William. We always have to go back to school on the basics of those leadership. And uh, so that's good. That's awesome. And and so what is an app that you're uh, having fun with right now or, or is helping you? Yeah, I'm t- and, and I know some of your other people have said this too. Uh, I'm We're testing Periscope some yep. and uh, and learning some about that and, and trying to figure out uh, what's the best way to use that. And I've got a lot of ideas on how I can use it, but but my biggest problem is time right now, hmm. and knowing when I can do it. And uh, so I'm really uh, starting that process and excited about the the, the, the possibilities that uh, are out there before us. That's the number one app I hear when I ask that question, even just out and about. My teenage yeah. teenage girls, uh, which would be my IT department, uh, <laughs> <laughs> showed me a, a new one this week. It's called Blab. You can just look it up. And it's basically a video chat room where you and three or four friends can have a video broad. It's like a uh, multi-grid periscope where three or four of you can be talking on the same screen and you're broadcasting out to your entire Twitter followers. It, it's it's amazing how fast things are changing, man. It's, oh. it's, it is extraordinary. Yep. So last question, put you on the spot. Tell us a time that it kind of all fell apart on stage. Just something to give us a smile and let us know we're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> I was a young preacher, very young, probably still a teenager. And, uh, you know, when you're in those years and you're formative and, uh, and all, you really, uh, say a lot of things that you probably don't have a clue what you're saying, obviously. And, you know, you work on certain ways you were going to say it. And one day I was on the stage at this church and, uh, and I was going to say, man, I was, I was rolling and I was going to make this big declaration. 
uh, like Billy Graham had made it, Jesus saves. And uh, boy, I got on a roll, and I said, Jesus shaves. <laughs> and then so <laughs> I thought, oh, my Lord, how do I take that one back? <laughs> that Jesus shaves. I think I blew some of their minds, but they uh, they did ask me back to preach later. We all had a good laugh on that day. <laughs> that is fantastic. Well, I know you're just super busy. want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Ronnie Floyd. If you don't know Cross Church, you need to know it. You need to listen to his messages. It's some of the best teaching out there. And be sure and check out his book. Ronnie, wish you the blessings as you travel around representing the convention and, and trying to juggle a church at the same time. Take care, my Thank friend. You, Thank you, William. A blessing to be with you. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. You can connect with us on Twitter at VanderblumenSG and hashtag your key takeaways with hashtag Vandercast. You can also receive more information about what we do here at Vanderblumen Search Group and notes from today's podcast at vanderblumen.com backslash podcast. See you next time.